It is a true uh, blessing to come to worship the Lord on the day that we commemorate the risen Savior. Actually, every Sunday when we gather together to, um, to worship the Lord, we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So praise the Lord that he has trenched us from uh, unpeace to a peaceful place, from being in hatred and vengeance to a life filled with his love. And so this morning, we will together study and uh, the theme of dying and resurrecting. Um, a professor, a teacher, a professor named David Paulison, he shared how God has saved him from a life of destruction. He said this, I came to faith in Jesus Christ when I was 25 years old. I wasn't raised as a Christian or in a Christian family. I grew up in a very liberal mainline church, probably a Unitarian in functional belief. I remember thinking as an adolescent that Jesus was a really good person who cared for people less fortunate than him. And therefore, we should be good people who care for people less fortunate than us. That was about the sum of my beliefs, that's what he said. During the time that he was at college, he continued to share. I was interested in whatever was hot, radical politics, anti-Vietnam war, drug culture, existentialism, new age practice, psychotherapy. And as a very minor subtext in my immersion in this culture, my good friend Bob became a Christian and we started a conversation. I, he said, I credit God's amazing grace for that conversation continuing, even though I did not want to be a Christian. For whatever reason, I didn't bail out on the conversation. So I continued to converse and debate with my Christian friend. So Bob and I argued for five years, and I have such a vivid memory of the evening when he, Bob, by the power of the Spirit, won the argument. We discussed, um, and he spoke in a very uncharacteristic way that evening. Bob discussed with me, as usual, about apologetics, about scripture, about Jesus Christ, and philosophy. And round and round the mulberry bush that I was always able to dodge out of. Then he got very personal and said, David, Diane and I really love you. We respect you. But what you believe and how you're living, you're destroying yourself. He put it right out there. He put it right out. You are destroying your life. And so I finally understood the fact that joy, not despair, would have the last word. I was convicted by the Holy Spirit, and it was like my life was passing before my eyes. All my sins, selfishness, pride, and wanting to run my own life. It was like a movie passing in front of me. It was an armor-piercing shell of convicting, conviction by the Spirit. And of all the sins to which one could point out, two were the worst that I saw. I had believed that despair got the last say in my life, and I was convicted that I had believed a lie. I had been an, an existentialist that death wins in the end. But very much like C.S. Lewis, in Surprise by Joy, I finally understood that fact that joy, not despair, would have the last word. I was also convicted that I had not wanted to need anyone to save me. I did not need anyone. I was, it was that fundamental unbelief. I want to make my own life work. I don't need a savior. I have no need for anyone. I don't want to have a Lord. Realizing that Jesus was Savior and Lord, I was profoundly laid low 
as I came face to face with my unbelief in the greatest gift that had ever been given. And scripture, naturally, was part of the conversion. In the midst of my despair, before the face of God, Bob shared with me the promise of Ezekiel 36. In Bob shared it. Ezekiel 36, 26, 27. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. I remember driving home and I cried out to God for mercy and I said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So I remember driving home that night. It was late by then and I didn't immediately understand that I've now become a Christian. I remember thinking in the car, hmm, that's interesting. I never thought of myself as a sinner before. So i just been blasted with this new reality, and then I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning, and I was absolutely flooded with joy. It was as if I was awakened out of my spiritual sleep, and the thoughts ran through my mind on awakening were, I'm home. I'm a Christian. It was as though my entire life had been a quest through hot, dusty roads, searching for something which wasn't God. But He was looking for me. I was looking for something else other than Jesus. But He was looking for me. And I found myself at home. I have found and loved. I have been found and loved. I'm a Christian. What did Jesus do to transform a person who lived in despair, knowing, thinking that death is the end and despair is the end? How did he have such hope? What changed? What happened to such a person? And so this morning, I would like to invite you to consider with me one verse in Romans 4, 20, verse 20 but we will also read from 20 to 25. No, uh, this person was Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, that he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God. What is the promise here? God promised Abraham that he would have descendants, children and descendants as the stars in the sky. And now he's about 100 years old and he had no son but he trusted in the Lord he placed his his faith in the promise but the words it was counted him it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone but for ours also it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. He was delivered for our trespasses and raised for our justification. There are four questions when we look at this verse. Who was delivered up for tres our trespasses and raised for our justification? The first question is, who delivered up Jesus Christ? Second question, why did Jesus, why was he delivered up? Thirdly, who raised Jesus from the dead? And fourth, why did Jesus come back to life? Why? So let us look at the first question. Who delivered up Jesus? Who delivered Jesus up for death? Who do you think delivered Jesus up to death? Jesus was delivered to the high priests and was um, trialed. And then he was delivered to the Gentiles to be crucified on the cross. And on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus foretold this occurrence. In Matthew 20, 18 to 19, he said, See that we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to the chief priests and scribes, and they would condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged 
and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. And then in Mark 15, 1, and as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. Pilate was the governor at that time who was in control. And now in John 19, 16, let us see that Pilate delivered him over to the soldiers to be crucified on the cross. They delivered Jesus to be crucified. But ultimately, who delivered Jesus to the people? Ultimately, it was God who delivered Jesus to be crucified. The Word of God in Acts 4, 27 to 28. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This is the work of God. God had planned this. God had given his son to come to earth to die for us. This is the plan of salvation of God. And the second question is, why was Jesus delivered up? Why was Jesus delivered up? For death. In the verse, it says that he was delivered for us. He was delivered for our transgressions. We see that the death of Jesus, he was not worthy of death, but he died because of our sins. He was delivered up for you and me, for the sins of mankind. That is the reason why Jesus was delivered up to death. Jesus was delivered up as the words that were written in Isaiah 6, 53, 12. Therefore, I would divide him, which is Jesus, I would divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So Jesus was not only sinless, but he was totally perfect. He was holy. He was the righteous one. He had no sin in him, but he took upon him our sins. And that is the reason why Jesus was delivered up to death. Jesus died not because he had sin. People die because they have sin. The Word of God says, for the wages of sin is death. Because Adam and Eve sinned, therefore death entered into the world. Jesus was one who had no sin, so he could not die. No matter what he, people did to him, he might be crucified to the cross, but he will not die because he had no sin. But he, he said that, I give my life over. So Jesus said that we are like sheep, have gone astray, but, and God had put all our iniquities upon him, all our sins upon him. So Jesus was delivered up and died because of us, not because of his sins. But he did not remain dead. Today is Risen Sunday. It's because Jesus rose from the dead. So who, who raised Jesus from the dead? Do you know who? In Galatians 1, 1 says that, it is God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So we see that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. When Jesus rose from the dead, that was the work of God the Father. He had accepted and received the punishment that Jesus received. And now he rose Jesus from the dead. And in John 2, 18, 22, we see that. So the Jews say to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What are these things? That is that Jesus said that he will destroy the temple and in three days it will be uh, built up again. So Jesus is saying about his own body, he said, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? 
but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and three days later, I will rise, raise it up. I will raise this temple in three days after it is destroyed. Talking about his body, three days later will be risen. And then we also continue to read in Romans 8, 11, says that if that Jesus worked, God worked through the Holy Spirit to raise Jesus from the dead. In verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we see that the Holy Spirit took part in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the doctrine of the Trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all three, the Trinity, but only one God, not three gods, one God. So we have the understanding of many but one. As we see, there's male and female, but there's no two types of mankind, right? There's only one mankind, male and female, one humanity, but two genders, one humanity, but two genders. But why is not, why is that? Because there's two genders, but one humanity. So there's three of the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, and the Spirit, but there's only one God. And so the three unite to create us. And in the union, un union to create us, he, there's also the union to raise Jesus from the dead. God the Father raised him from the dead, and the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And so the resurrection of Jesus, what does it mean to us? Why did Jesus raise, why was Jesus raised from the dead? Why did he come back to life? It shows us the sacrifice that Jesus lifted up, offered up, was pleasing to God the Father. Jesus took upon him our sins and died on our behalf. And when God looked at that sacrifice, God was pleased, and so he raised Jesus from the dead. He accepted the price that was paid for our sins, and praise the Lord for that. And the second re re reason that Jesus came back from the dead is evidence that he is the Son of God. In the verse, Romans 1, 3 to 4 says that concerning his son, who was descended from, de descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Someone asked me, Jesus is the Son of God. He's not God. Well, if, a, if, uh, if you're born from a fish, is that a baby fish from the mommy fish? So the same way. That if, you, if your fish is born from a fish, it's a fish, okay? So if we are, <laughs> anyways, basically if you are born by the Spirit of God, then we, Jesus is God. We have this body, but he gives us, he puts on us, clothes us his spiritual characteristics, the divine nature. God gives us the divine nature. Therefore, we are a child of God because of what he has done for us. And the third thing is what God, is that God, that Jesus was victorious over death. That is, death has been swallowed in victory. So we see that the, the, the sting of death has been swallowed up by the resurrection of the, G of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we no longer have to fear death. The Vietnamese are very afraid of death. If you hear of death, you're afraid. But you know what? We don't have to fear death because death is only the, the gateway to pass through to go in the presence of the Father, of God. So do you know who raised Jesus from the dead and why Jesus rose from the dead? Because Jesus' resurrection, and because his, his resurrection is uh, evidence that God accepted his sacrifice. When we do something wrong, there's a consequence of what we do, right? Of what we do wrong. If you drive carelessly 
and you cause pain to someone who have, you have caused the accident. That's a consequence. But then that person said, oh, don't worry, I can take care of it. And that person just say, don't worry about the accident, I will take care of it. This is, Jesus did that. He died so that we don't have to take, pay the penalty for our sins and to be separated from God eternally, but that we can draw close to God. Jesus on the cross called out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God turned his back on Jesus because of our sins. Our sins were upon Jesus Christ. But when Jesus resurrected, he no longer bore our sins. There was no more sin to bear. And now we are accepted in Jesus Christ. God raised Jesus from the dead so that he can declare justification to many people. As in Isaiah 53, 11 says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are connected with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are cleansed of all our sins, and we take on the righteousness and the justification of Jesus Christ, and we are justified or righteous just as Jesus is. So, all of the, uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is needed for our justification. The completeness of that, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the completeness to bring us to justification. Because of his death, we die with Jesus Christ. We die, Jesus died to our sins and we die to our sins. So as we are accepted by God, He accepts us, and we are loved and accepted by God in Jesus Christ. And in this way, we are considered righteous. The words in English is justification, or to be declared, to be declared righteous. This is justification is a legal or forensic term belonging to the law court. Its opposite is condemnation. Both are the pronouncements of a judge. In a Christian context, they are the alternative eschatological verdicts which God the judge may pass on judgment day. So when God justifies sinners today, he anticipates his own final judgment by bringing into the present what belongs properly to the last day. This is a theologian, John Stott. John Stott has said this. I would like to, I'd like to explain this. Justification, or to be proclaimed or declared justified, this is the proclamation of the pronouncement of a judge. When a sinner stands before a judge, after being examined and judged, the judge, he will strike his hammer and he will announce or pronounce. Either that sinner has to be is, uh, guilty or not guilty. Either he is guilty or not guilty. Before the Holy God, we know that we are sinners. The Holy Spirit of God lets us see that we are sinners. Our conscience let us see that we are sinners. And the accuse, accuser, the devil, accuses us that we are sinners. But the righteous judge declares that we not only are not guilty, but we are righteous. Do you, do you see the difference between a sinner and a righteous person? We not only are ones who are sinless with no sin, but we have been put on the righteousness of God. So we are righteous. So the one who is no sin and the righteous are different. How can we be righteous? If a judge, a righteous judge, considers and pronounces that the sinner has no sin, we see that that is unjust, right? That is injustice. People will rebel and they will um, burn houses down and everything because of the injustice. But how is it that a righteous judge can declare that the sinner is a righteous person while we know that we are sinners? 
is because of Jesus Christ. Jesus took upon himself our sins. He took on himself our punishment so that we can be cleansed of all our sins. If I was in debt of a million dollars that a billionaire gave me a million dollars that he gave so easily, but now he says that your debt is paid, you don't have to pay the debt, then I no longer am in debt with him, right? If I have been a sinner, I have been so full of all types of my sins. And now Jesus Christ took all my sins on the cross. Now I no longer have those sins. I have declared with no sin, not guilty. Not only does the judge, Jesus, considers me and pronounces me not guilty, but he also gives me and declares me righteous, just. Why is that? because Jesus put upon me his righteousness. He gave me himself, and he comes to live himself in me. And now Jesus' righteousness becomes my righteousness. When I am a child of God, and I'm not, when I'm accepted as a child of God, all the goodness of Jesus belongs to me. Just as a billionaire, if he now takes me in and adopts me as his, as his son, then all his inheritance, all his possessions belong to me. So Jesus is God. He came. He came not only to cleanse us of all our sins, but he gives us his life and all that is his. He gives to us. So therefore, the righteous one, Jesus, not only is righteous to correct what is wrong, but also to make what is right. So that is accomplished through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death and the resurrection of Jesus are the two aspects, two parts of the salvation plan. In the beginning, the first part, in the first part, God had to um, meet the standards for the punishment of sin. But not only has he cleansed us of our sins, but he gives us his righteousness and he lives in us to make us a righteous person. And Jesus said, I am the life and the resurrection. Whoever believes me will live though he has died. And those who believe in me will never die, but will live. Do you believe that? Jesus said that whoever believes in me will not die. What does that mean? That means that we will have eternal life with Christ. Right now, mankind dies and is separated from God forever. But now Jesus came to bring us to him. And Jesus said, though we are uh, may, though we die and no longer breathe, yet we will live in Christ. So resurrection is very important. Resurrection not only talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it talks about the resurrection, our resurrection. The resurrection is the keystone of salvation. The word keystone is a very special name, a word. Do you know what a keystone is? Keystone you don't know what a keystone is? Okay, someone who may be an architect knows what a keystone is. If you see a window, right? A window like this, right? Um, actually, no, a window that's like an arch. Or a, an arch. When you see an arch like this, in the middle, there is a trapezoid, a trapezoid um, structure right there, like a stone right in the middle. And then they... Um, if you remove that, if you re, I'm sorry, if you remove everything else, it will stand. But if you remove that keystone, it, everything else around it will collapse. So that is the keystone. Jesus Christ is the keystone, and the resurrection of Jesus is the keystone. If that, if Jesus did not come back from the dead, if Jesus did not rose from the dead, then everything in Christianity just collapses. But because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Christianity is for real, and Jesus has risen. So his resurrection is the evidence to let us see that he died for us and he can give us life. The wages of sin, the result of sin is only one result, consequence, and it is death. And Jesus rose from the dead to pay the price for our sins. And not only that, but Jesus cleansed us from all our sins. And Jesus resurrected. That is evidence that he, 
God the Father had accepted the price for our sins. And Jesus did that for us. And we celebrate, we celebrate the victory of Jesus over death, not only on Risen Sunday, but every day we celebrate the risen Lord. Every Sunday when we gather together, we celebrate the risen Lord, He who has died and has risen and is now living. If you today are like David Pottison, you are living in despair, and you don't know why you're living, and you don't know when you die, what will happen. This morning, know that Jesus was delivered up to death for you and that he resurrected so that we can be declared justified, just and righteous before God, and that we can enter into a relationship with God right now and into eternity. So therefore, I call upon you to come to the Lord and have the Holy Spirit of God speak to your heart. Look at your life and know that you are, that you have sinned. For the Bible says very clearly, for all have sinned. Every one of us has sinned before God. And sin is very gruesome. And sin is very serious. And that we will go to be in eternal hell, separated from God. And we will continue to live in vengeance and hatred and in pride and in our selfishness. We will live in regret because of our what we have done and what we have, the good that we have, should have done, but not have done, that has not done. But when you acknowledge that you are a sinner before God, there is good news for you. That is, Jesus Christ has poured out his blood for you. He has taken upon himself your sins, and he has buried your sins. In, he has buried it, and now he gives you life. He gives you eternal life. And now what must you do? Just open, raise your hands, reach out your hands, and receive and say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive you. Come into my life and be Lord of my life. I need you, Lord. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and rule in my life, reign in my life. When you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will come to you. His spirit will change your life from your heart of, uh, of a stone to become a heart of flesh so that you can call out, say, Abba, Father, to live in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. As you bow your heads and close your eyes, I would like to ask this morning, anyone who have heard the call of the voice of God uh, this in your heart, your heart has been uh, judged judged because you have rejected the gift of God judged because you live far from God these past day, years but you have returned you have uh, repented and known that say that Jesus is God you place your trust in him to trust in the salvation of, of God to be his children so this morning if you want to reveal or to show forth your desire to have this, please raise your hand. S raise your hand and say, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to save me, and I desire that you save me. If you have heard the voice of God in your heart, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father Almighty, we rejoice for the salvation you have given us through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, and you've risen from the dead, and you are our righteousness. And we thank you, Lord. We exalt your name. And for all glory and honor is yours forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.